I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Taylor Sparks, and our audio guru, Jared Duffy. How's it going, everyone? Hello, hello. We are still not yet back at the University of Utah. We're still in the Sparks shed. Who knows when this coronavirus, you know, ter- reign of terror is going to come to an end. But we will keep dropping episodes for you regardless. Yeah, and we've made some, uh, we've done a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I finally got around to updating the website. If you ever went on it before, it looked nice. But on our episodes list, if you tried to search for stuff, it just, it didn't work, <laughs> uh, period. Uh, and uh, that's nice because now. at the time, I didn't know how JavaScript worked. And now I've <laughs> updated it, and I still don't know how JavaScript works. But I've gotten better at stealing people's code and coercing it to my ends. Uh, so definitely go check it out because I think it looks a little bit cleaner, has some new information about us, and uh, more updates on that to come. Expect new things on there soon. Now, on your average episode, we get a lot of feedback from listeners, which we love to get, and all the time people are saying, do an episode on this, do an episode on that, but today, we're doing an episode on something that we are excited about. So, Andrew, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to be talking about a revolution in nuclear fuel design, the Triso Particle. Um, This was actually sent in by a listener requesting that we cover these, and as we dug even deeper into the topic, we found a lot of great information on how you design materials for nuclear applications and what makes these materials so special. So we're going to close the hatch on our MDDS, the Materialism Deep Dive Submersible, and get right to it. Um, Before we even get into how these work, maybe it's best that we start with how nuclear reactors and power even works. Sparks, you want to dive yeah. into that? So, you know, when, when people talk about nuclear reactors, you're probably assuming that this is a very complicated system, right? You've seen the pictures, the giant concrete cooling domes and all that jazz. So you'd assume that there's, you know, a lot going on there. But when you dive into the schematics of how these things actually work, at least the current generation of reactors are sort of shockingly simple, the basic operation. If you've seen steam generation, right, and how that can be led to power, right, by turning turbines... It's essentially the same thing happening on happening in a nuclear reactor. The difference is what the source of heat is. We're not burning coal. We're not burning wood or anything like that. We are generating heat using a nuclear reaction. So how does it work? Well, inside every nuclear reactor, the current ones anyways, there are three basic components we need to be familiar with. Well, first off, there's different types of nuclear reactions, right? When people talk about nuclear, there's fission and fusion, right? Fusion is putting things together, right? And through that bond, you're releasing energy. And fission is the other way around. You're breaking things apart and you're extracting energy. So we have been working on fusion for a really long time. In fact, just less than a week ago, I saw an article at Lawrence Livermore National Lab that they had a breakthrough where they're getting closer to achieving ignition, meaning for the first time, they're putting enough energy into it that they're actually fusing particles together. Almost there, it sounds like, which is pretty exciting. But we've been doing... Fission, splitting things apart for a long time. What, 60, 70 years now? More than that. When did it start? Since like the, right after the 40s. Anyways, we've been doing this for quite a while, fission. So if you're going to have a nuclear reactor, you have to have something that can be split apart. And obviously, the bigger that that the atoms get, the more easily we can break them apart, right? Because they're not held together. They're sort of so much mass that they're more easily broken apart. So the fissile materials that are typically used are things like uranium, right? And there's different isotopes. There's uranium-235, there's 238. Um, If you've heard people talk about enriched uranium or plutonium or weapons grade, you know, that sort of gets into the weeds of what isotopes you're using, what's the fraction of the fissile material, the stuff that can undergo these, you know, splits, as opposed to filler material or other stuff called poisons, which we'll get to in a moment. But in your nuclear power plant, you've got 235 or 238, right? Right. And what's great about this is that it's actually a pretty scalable process. If you want a bigger nuclear reactor that creates more energy, you can just add more of this fissile material. Um, Large reactors will have thousands of these rods of material where they literally pack the fissile material into rods, maybe about a centimeter in diameter, and I I don't know how long, several feet long. Um, You put these things together in sort of a cluster, and that is your source of heat generation. So that's the first thing you have to have, fissile material. Second thing you have to have is a moderator. 
Andrew, what's a moderator? The purpose of the moderator is to slow down these fast-moving neutrons. And because, as we kind of alluded to, it's more of an elemental process, um, really the things that we tend to use are hydrogen um, or carbon. But because it doesn't have to just be hydrogen or just carbon, it can be alloyed with something. They'll typically have uh -huh. metallic hydrides or carbides uh, in your cladding materials or just in the surrounding matrix uh, surrounding the Around fuel. Around the fuel, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's how we they will slow down the... That's right. So in the if you've heard of a light water reactor, what, what's the light part? Well, there's light water and there's heavy water. So if you take hydrogen dioxide, right, water, uh, you can make regular old water. But you could also take an isotope of hydrogen where it's got two neutrons instead of one. And now you have deuterium. This is heavy water, right? So they'll use these. There's both are out there. And what they're doing is when you take and you split a uranium ion, right, when you, when you do fission, right, you split it up. It doesn't actually take a very energetic neutron. Something with 0 0.04 electron volts is enough to actually trigger the fusion of uranium-235. Well, let's go back to the idea of moderators, right? So let's say you're going bowling. You take a heavy bowling ball, you roll it down the aisle, you give it enough energy that you can basically knock the pins all over the place. Well, in the case of nuclear fission, what would happen is like, imagine that you threw your bowling ball down and then all of a sudden from that grouping of pins, out comes flying a bowling ball at like hundreds of miles an hour. That's essentially what happens when you do this. There's so much potential energy packed up in these atoms that when you split them, a new neutron, well, many new neutrons are produced, and these things have crazy amounts of energy. They typically leave with something on the order of one million electron volts. Remember, it only took hundreds of, a, of an electron volt to split this thing. Now you're producing things in the you know tens to hundreds of million times more energetic and what's shocking, you know, what I didn't realize coming into this episode is that when you produce these really crazy high energy neutrons, I thought that that would lead to like a runaway reaction, that they would be so energetic that they would just be causing fissile events all around you and it would just be a chain reaction. And so I figured that you needed a moderator to calm them down so they would react with things less. But that's not the case. It's wild. It turns out when you have these things that are hundreds of million times overly energetic than what you want they become far less likely to participate in other fission reactions. Uh, the number I found is that they are 500 times less probable to incite a nuclear fission event. You actually want to promote slow neutrons uh, in order to continue the reaction because if too many of these fast neutrons get created, your reaction will actually stop. You have a problem. Yeah, so totally uh, counterintuitive finding there, at least for me reading about this. In any case, so yeah, they will add either water in light water reactors or they'll add deuterium, right? But these are things that are going to moderate. They're going to slow down these newly formed neutrons so that they can interact with other ones. So you can have a stable chain reaction of events happening. And obviously, every time that you're splitting one of these materials, it's producing a lot of energy. Plus these neutrons, as they're flying out and getting moderated by the water, they're warming the water up. And that's the whole point of modern day, you know, the modern reactors that we're currently using. Water is the heating me medium. You want it to get hot so it produces steam, which drives your turbines, right? So all of this is well and good, but how do you prevent a chain reaction from getting out of control, right? What if it, there is too much reaction happening? It's splitting too many, and then this gets too hot where it leads to problems. Well, that's where the third component comes in. We had to have our fissile material. We had to have a moderator. And then the last one is control rods. Control rods are things that we can insert into the middle of our sort of reactor core, and they soak up extra neutrons. This is essentially what they're doing. So you're typically using materials with a high neutron cross-section, which we'll describe in a moment, like boron or cadmium. And then, like I said, you can raise or lower these into the reactor in real time to have it reach the state of heat production that is stable for your system so you don't get any thermal runaways or anything like that. Yeah, typically today they'll use... In the older designs, they were control rods that were inserted, but today they'll typically have drum rods where one portion or fraction of the drum is made of your, your boron or your absorbing material, and they just rotate them. And through rotation, they can oh, control cool. the amount of uh, boron cool. that's exposed and thus have a more precise... Uh, nice. Even the control rods, too, they weren't entirely boron or cadmium because A, that's expensive, and B, was pointless. They only had specific parts yeah. of it, which is... Uh, just as much as you need basically oh yeah and that's what yeah. caused uh, uh, some disaster issues in the past because they weren't actually coded enough where they needed it and so you get that few split second longer reactions gotcha. than intended so what what is so special about boron or cadmium or some of these materials that they use it comes down to this fascinating you know fundamental property of different materials called its neutron cross section Right? So it, as it's defined, the neutron cross-section is the likelihood of interaction between incident neutron and your target nucleus. So different materials, you know, iron or nickel or cobalt or whatever, 
all of these materials are going to, we know how they react with x-rays, right? So we talked about that on the show. When we talked about diffraction and stuff. Um, materials get interacting. There's a very predictable, predictable curve. It's basically one over the atomic number. You see this sort of gradual decay. Of course, there are sort of bumps, but it's, it's rather predictable for electron and x-ray interaction with materials. That is not the case with neutrons. It's wild. It's like a scatter plot. It's just like seriously like noise is what it looks like. And it's, it's element specific too, um, which makes it kind of an interesting problem because typically when we think about materials, we like to think about how different structures can dr- dramatically change how a material behaves, like uh, graphite to diamond, for instance. But when it comes to a nuclear cross-section, it doesn't matter what structure you have. It's the element that yeah. matters. And so for whatever reason, and I couldn't, on it. I wish I could, but I couldn't tell you why boron and cadmium, some of those materials have such a high cross-section, but they tend to really absorb those neutrons. Now, what do they do with them? That's the next question. There's actually two different categories of neutron cross-section. You have your, uh, what is defined as fission cross-section, which refers to how much will it absorb and produce a fissile event, right? Meaning it's going to absorb it and split. So uranium, for example, would have a relatively higher fiss- cross-section for this, uh, right? Because it splits a- after absorbing it. But other materials... Um, might actually absorb it and then don't cause fissile products, right? So we call those the capture cross-section, okay? So for things like our control rods, those would be things that would have a high capture cross-section as opposed to a high fission cross-section. Now, what I liked about this is that there is a unit of measurement that they use for this, right? And it is the barn, is the standard unit, which is a holdback from the Manhattan Project days. Um, In those days, obviously, this was happening at Purdue University, and they needed some way to be secret but talk about the ability to absorb things. So it has units of area, right? How much gets absorbed per area. And so it's 100 femtometers squared, and they called it a barn from the old saying in English that you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn if you were throwing a baseball or something if you're a bad shot. So I think that's kind of fun. That's held over, and they still talk about barns in in modern, you know, nuclear physics, which is kind of cool. There's a very interesting story that ties back to the heavy water and then Manhattan Project, and kind of all of this about Niels Bohr. We probably all know who Niels Bohr is, obviously. He's got a lot of things named after Structure him. Structure of atom guy. Yeah. So he, the first really interesting one was that he refused to leave Germany for the, and, and the surrounding areas, because he was in Denmark for the longest time, because he just wanted to continue his work, even though the Nazis were encroaching on his area. And where they were the first time, they had the Nobel Prize won by, I believe, two Danish scientists. I don't know the name off the top of my head. And he knew that the Nazis wanted the Nobel Prize because it's like a cool trophy to have. Oh, this and is when he dissolved it, yeah, right? Instead of, yeah, instead of uh, burying it, they dissolve it. And then when they came back in the 50s, I think, or like late 40s, it was still there in the beaker. In the aqua regia. Yeah, they took it, they got it out of that, and they sent it right back to Nobel Prize, like the foundation, and they recast the Nobel Prize out of that gold. How cool, man. Leave it to a chemist and a physicist to know how that process works. Rad. But the big one that is very like important was... I guess he had spoken to a German scientist who was kind of bragging about the fact that they wanted to make a nuclear bomb. And at the time, he never thought it was possible. And that kind of pushed him over the edge that he wanted to leave because he thought he'd get conscripted into it. And so he makes a secret plan to leave, I believe, with Britain. And what happens is, is up until like the last hour, the plan is fine. And then the Nazis find out about it just before it goes. And they go to his house. And so he puts heavy water into an ice-cold beer and takes that beer bottle with him out, and then he flees to another country. And then in that country, he gets in the bottom of a British fighter and sits in the belly of, like, a fighter jet, and they fly all the way out of, uh, like, mainland Europe. Where he's carrying his heavy yeah, water with him the, in the yeah, bottle. Yeah, and then he Too passes cool. out from the high altitude, and they take him to the hospital, and the entire time in the hospital, he's still clutching the heavy water bottle. Too flipping cool, man. I love some of the history, the backstories of these of these people. So rad. Well, I mean, there's been 60, 70 years of research into nuclear reactors. We've solved a lot of problems along the way. We have actually now, although nuclear gets a bad rap, I'm a big, I'm very big proponent of nuclear because it is a very clean, awesome way to generate power. And we've sorted out a lot of the bugs. But that said, we can always do better. And there is a big push in the United States and around the world to move away from our current fleet of uh, reactors to higher efficiency ones things that are safer, that are more efficient, that are better in lots of ways, that consume fuel in different ways. So these are categorized under this broad term of generation four nuclear reactors. And in general, these pose wild new challenges for the material scientists in the audience, right? We are thinking of things like, obviously they they could operate at higher temperatures. That's always harder. They operate at higher radiation doses, which is challenging. There's higher pressures. 
very often the coolants that they use aren't just pleasant things like light water or heavy water. We're now moving towards molten salts, for example, maybe sodium or other things. This gets a lot harder in terms of handling the materials challenges associated with these Generation 4 reactors. Well, I know that molten salt is the thing that's required to have a full thorium reactor. And thorium is great because it's got the lower half-life and it's got the much smaller And footprint. availability of thorium yeah, is different too. and availability. But I know that it's almost impossible to keep molten salt for that long. We've got a guy in our department, Mike Simpson. We're going to have him on a future episode who that's all he does is try and work on that. Now, I'm going to zoom in just for a moment on there's many materials challenges and we'll probably do a future episode, but let me talk about cladding for a minute because it's got a cool story behind it. Cladding, when I say cladding, we mentioned that we have to have our fissile material, these rods of, right, the uranium. Um, these are surrounded with a tube. They're put in a little long, you know, one centimeter diameter tubes. Well, what sort of material do you make that tube out of? Can you just use steel? Do you use aluminum? What do you use? It actually is hard because remember our, our discussion on nuclear cross, neutron cross-section Many materials absorb these neutrons, and then that energy that they have, remember these things have one milli electron volts before they get moderated. There's a ton of energy there, so your material will melt. It also gets damaged by the radiation. It produces fissile products like gases form, which causes cracking and bubbling. It is a horrific environment from a materials durability standpoint. Fortunately, if you look at the sort of list of materials that have a low neutron cross-section and a high melting point, your options are pretty low, and they discovered early on that zirconium. Zirconium will do it. Now, if you're familiar with zirconium metal, you'll know that it is chemically almost identical to hafnium. Trying to separate these two is a, is a mess. It's expensive. But they use nuclear-grade zirconium, Andrew was pointing out before this episode, that strictly because they've pulled the hafnium out because it has such a different cross-section. Yeah, it has to be less than 0.02 weight percent hafnium. Yeah. There's a cool history on these things that they discovered in nuclear because obviously it was the 50s, 60s when they started making these nuclear power plants. And then they just sort of found problems as they were going. Like in the 60s, they, deserve, they discovered that there was strain hardening going on. Like as you had your components in the nuclear reactor, they were getting irradiated. It was causing damage. And so they had to, in real time, find ways to fix them before major failures occurred. And then in the 70s, they started observing swelling due to gaseous fissile products. So if you produce krypton gas or whatever else as a, as a byproduct of splitting these atoms... Well, now you've got gas pockets in your material, and these things cause internal pressure so that it swells, actually. So you actually see swelling of the, of the fissile materials or the components around it. And then in the 80s, they saw helium embrittlement. If you generate helium, right, this can actually work its way into materials. The same thing happens with hydrogen, and it makes them more brittle. So it's cool that in real time they were observing these things and fixing them because nobody told us how to do nuclear reactors. There was no blueprint, right? They were figuring out as they went, and they were able to do this without major disasters. Obviously, we're going to do a future uh, micro episode where we've been talking about failures. We're going to talk about some of the failures that have happened in the nuclear industry because there's lessons to be learned there. But for the most part, they headed off most of these problems before they got really challenging. Now, zirconium, let's talk about it for just a moment. Some of the more common failures that have happened with the fuel systems have been related to, well, 70% in light water reactors anyways, are due to vibration-induced wear and cladding penetration by foreign matter. So your cladding, the metal that goes around your fuel, if it gets, if it starts to interact with the fuel, that's the problem basically there. Now, the other 30% are due to what are called crud deposits. This was the scientific term. It stood for Chalk River Unidentified Deposits. So this was a nuclear plant in the early days. And uh, it's a total misnomer, right? They now know what it is. It's iron and nickel and chromium oxides coming from steel corrosion that then deposits on it. And why do you, you know, why is it such a big deal that crud deposits on it? Well, remember, these things are very high temperature and you have coolant flowing across them. And if you get deposits, that can physically block the path of the, of the coolant. So it messes with your fuel, your heat transfer out of your fuel, and that can lead to runaway and melting and other problems. So we'd like to avoid those things. But how do you have metals prevent corrosion in these extremely nasty environments? Well, that was the reason why zirconium is really a miracle material for this. Zirconium, for one thing, it has a low neutron cross-section, a high good melting point. It has pretty good thermal conductivity, so it can dissipate heat pretty well. But really what sets it apart is now its corrosion resistance as well. To this day, there's a lot of things going on that we don't understand when it comes to corrosion and zirconium. One of the key things that we don't understand is that, first off, most of the time, as you go towards a pure material, most pure materials become more corrosion resistant. So if you take gold, right, and it's an alloy, as you purify it, it becomes more corrosion resistant. But that's not the case with zirconium. It actually becomes more corrosion resistant uh, prone for pure zirconium, and they actually intentionally dope it with little bits of additives. And so this led to this family of what are called zirc alloys, zirconium alloys, right? 
the very first one that was discovered was when they added 1.5 weight percent tin. That's Zerk Alloy 1. Zerk Alloy 1 was pretty good. And then I love this one. Zerk Alloy 2 was even better. Zerk Alloy 2, but it was discovered. You already know the answer. How was it discovered? By accident, of course, right? They basically had a bit of steel that was melted in with it. And so now you've got components from steel. So iron, a little bit of chromium, a little bit of nickel. And that, even though they're present in small amounts, made a much better alloy. Again, most alloys, like think of stainless steel, you had to add a lot of chromium, 13% before you get that stainless, you know, corrosion resistant properties. Here, we're talking about 1%. Really small changes in dopants are having pretty radical impacts on the corrosion resistance of zircaloys. So there's been several more over the years, zircaloy 3 and 4, where they're changing and tuning these ratios. Nowadays, the alloys that they use are Z-I-R-L-O, Zerlo, or uh, M5. These things have a bit of tin, a bit of niobium. Um, you're looking at maybe 1%. But there's still a lot of work being done to make better cladding materials. This is actually one of the research areas that my group is working on, looking at whether or not high entropy alloys, which have high temperature stability and pretty good corrosion resistance, might be candidates for that. And that's something we've been doing with funding from Idaho National Lab. So a lot of what we went over has to do with older, what we call generation three reactors. These are the light water reactors that we have in deployment presently. Uh, these are usually water cooled and using steam generation from that water to generate electricity. But there's a big push right now for what we call generation four reactors, which as we start to progress closer and closer to actually implementing these, it starts to become kind of a poor term to describe these because there's so many different designs that all qualify under generation four. But what we want to focus on are these high temperature gas reactors, uh, which use these triso particles that we mentioned at the very beginning. Just to kind of do a brief overview of how these reactors work, they're typically going to have graphite cores that are cooled by pressurized helium where our coolant outlet temperatures are in the range of 700 to 950 C. Woo. Also, that's efficiency though, right? When you oh, go yeah. to those high temperatures, that's the whole reason of moving to these. Yeah, and you're going to get significantly better yeah, energy generation from them. And the difference is that unlike water, helium isn't going to undergo a phase change when it yeah. gets really hot. And so you have less issues with um, that. In addition, water is like one of the best catalysts for corrosion out yeah. there. Like add water to any sort of metal system and corrosion now, is likely that with to an, happen. an inert gas. Yeah, you're going to resolve a lot of your corrosion concerns. Now, the structure of these reactors is a little bit different too. We still have the same concept of control rods, but it's set up a little bit different. Rather than having these metal cladding materials, we actually just have machined graphite blocks, typically in a prismatic or hexagonal structure. And these have coolant channels and fuel channels. So the, the graphite sort of is the cladding, basically. It is, it's the material that both holds the fuel and has the passageways for your working fluid to go through it. Yep, absolutely. Rad, because cladding's a big problem to solve. And if you just basically bypass it with a new design of your fuel itself, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in this case, the fuel is going to be these triso particles. Now, what, is, what does that mean? What are we talking about when we say a triso particle? These are small spheres on the range of 350 to 600 micrometers in diameter. And you can kind of think of them in terms of like a, a jawbreaker. If you've ever seen one of those, right, as you get through it more and more, there's different layers and they have different colors. Kind of the same thing where we have a small kernel at the core. This is our nuclear material. This is our uranium oxide, uranium oxycarbide, uranium carbide. Uh, and then surrounding that, we have a porous, 50% of its theoretical density, pyrolytic carbon buffer layer. Why is it porous? Why do they need that? Because during the re nuclear reactions that occur, we're going to get a lot of new products that are, are released. There's about like 30 different chemical species that get produced yeah, when, you, uh, when you have a fission reaction. And 25% of those are gases. I oh, gotcha. And so, so you're going to get expansion. swelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And so porous carbon is both pretty mechanically compliant. If you start swelling into it, it will, it will give way. Um, but the pores also allow it to trap gases uh, that, that get sent out from the reaction. Um, but there's still a question of, okay, these you know, uh, heavy metals and other sorts of fizzled products are being produced, how do we encapsulate them? So that gets us to our next layer, which is a dense, highly isotropic inner pyrocarbon layer. What do you mean pyrocarbon? What is this? Just This is just like you burnt something off to get to the carbon? So it's the same as graphite, but there's covalent bonding between the graphene sheets. Okay, so it's like a hybrid. It's, it's not fully sp2 or sp3. It's got a mixture of bonding. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And this layer serves a couple of different functions. First, it helps retain a number of the different fission products that are released, so to prevent them from escaping and entering the rest of the reactor. But it also serves as a protection for the next layer. The next layer is silicon carbide, and the process of using chemical vapor deposition requires that hydrochloric acid gas is produced, and that could attack the kernel uh, and, and do quite a bit of damage. 
And so this pyrolytic carbon layer, this inner dense isotropic layer that we mentioned, kind of protects it from that and serves as a substrate for the silicon carbide layer. So tell me why we need the silicon carbide there. Because you just said we want a really compliant layer right next to the core. That makes Mm -hmm. sense, producing gases. Then you need something to protect it from this next layer. But why do we need the silicon carbide? Well, for a couple of reasons. First, it adds mechanical strength to it. You can almost even think of this like an M&M as well, right? It has that hard... This is that candy shell? Yeah, yeah. It has that hard, crunchy outside shell. And silicon carbide is a ceramic, so it's both like very good at high temperatures. It's not going to um, change its uh, and deform its shape too much. Um, but it's also very dense. And because of the packing of silicon carbide, it tends to limit things from diffusing through it, which ends up being important because... Those isotropic pyrolytic carbon layers are, are great, but they're not going to stop things like strontium yeah. or cesium. So this holds those in. Silicon carbide can. Oh, this is so cool. All the problems with cladding that we had before, you're basically solving at the individual particle level. Your individual particle has all these things built into it. Yeah, exactly. And then finally, on top of the silicon carbide, they deposit one more pyrocarbon layer, dense isotropic. And the purpose of that is actually to protect the silicon carbide layer during handling because ceramics are brittle. Uh, and so as you're trying to move these things around, you're loading them, you're compacting them, you want something there. I imagine this also improves, because you're going to put this in a graphite block Exactly, eventually. right. It so helps with adhesion, adhesion and bonding. Very cool. So they take a bunch of these particles, and they pack them into these cylinders, and that's what they put in our graphite blocks. And this would be in future reactors. But they're testing them now, right? We have fast t- advanced test reactors, right, where they're actually trying these out. Right, so these have been tested since the 60s. Actually, late 50s is when they actually started this concept of a particle fuel. But up till now, they are not available in any commercially operating nuclear power plants. But they have been extensively tested and proven to be one of the safest methods. Before we get into really how safe they are, uh, it's probably good that we start and actually figure out how we got to this point. Because it wasn't one of those scenarios where someone just woke up and had a dream about the triso particle. Um, But we're going to cut to a quick break, but stick with us. After that, we're going to get into how these things came to be and all about their fantastic properties and what their future might hold. This month's episode is sponsored by MatMatch. MatMatch is a company that's passionate about material science and whose goal is to help connect materials engineers with materials providers and suppliers. Now, obviously, this episode, we couldn't really tie it in. You can't yet go and buy everything you need to build a nuclear reactor there, but maybe one day. We're getting there. The technology is improving. Their platform is used by over a million engineers every year. It's completely free to use, and it's so simple and easy. Head over to matmatch.com and check out how useful it might be for your next engineering project. We shouted this one out in the last episode. If you're a teacher or you know a teacher and you really want to have them teach stuff about material science, have them head over to Acer's website, which is teachmaterialscience.org. They're giving away free material science kits, and they're great. They're full of some really cool stuff. And we're actually hoping to get some that we'll be giving away to the listeners soon. Yeah, by the way, I teach, right, for a living. So I know what a big impact a demo can do. If you've got a cool demo, students will actually remember the content in a way that is just impossible without that demo. So check it out. They'll send this kit out to you totally for free because they're good people over there. Today's episode is also sponsored by Materials Today. Now you'll notice all this wonderful content we're telling you about the challenges of materials in the nuclear industry. I actually pulled it from an awesome article at Materials Today. It's entitled Materials Challenges for Nuclear Systems, written by a quartet of folks at University of Wisconsin, Oak Ridge National Lab, Idaho National Laboratory. Unsurprisingly, for such an important topic like the materials development in nuclear fuel, Materials Today has great articles and resources there. And they do obviously more than that. If you're not familiar with them, check them out. You can go to materialstoday.com. They have links to some of our episodes there, which is awesome. And they're even making some of the articles that we talk about in this episode freely available for you to read for a period of time. So check them out in our show notes. We'll have a link to it. And if you haven't you know, considered working with Materials Today, either publishing there or advertising on that platform, we hope that you'll give them a look because we think they're a pretty great company to work with. Hey, we're back from the break. Let's dive into how these particles even came to be. Where did this even start? Well, it actually started in the 1950s in the UK with what they called the Dragon Project. 
Uh, they actually called their reactor that they tested these things in the Dragon. I was going to say, that is an awful name for something that has a chance to <laughs> blow up in a fire yeah. demise. Yeah, I don't feel like lawyers would have let that go today. Well, yeah, it was like a company. Well, we'll get there. So uh, this was the, the famous person who was um, promoting this was Fortescue. And he ended up going on to collaborate with the U.S. and Germany. And Germany, uh, the company that was chiefly in charge of a lot of the developments there was called Nukem. <laughs> this is a Which, joke, right? There's no way that's for real. Well, I mean, I don't think at the time or even in that German. That wasn't the vernacular. Uh, you know, they didn't have this sort of slang. But uh, with what we know now, it's it's definitely a little bit on the nose. Um Maybe not the best name for a nuclear company. Uh, at the same time, the U.S. actually had a lot of extensive work being performed by companies like General Atomics, Battelle Memorial Institute, uh, and then as well as the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Those are kind of the big names in terms of our um, research and development in nuclear technology. I mean, General Atomics has been around forever. Yeah, so the U.S. didn't have uh, as great of a name. They had the Peach Bottom Reactor, and that actually comes... Uh, the name from its location, and that's the Peach Bottom Township in York County, Pennsylvania. See, when I read Not the that, booty, I assumed it was because of the booty. I, yeah, they, they they weren't using emojis like that. When I read then. that, I was like, oh, it's in Georgia. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Uh, in, in Germany, you have uh, companies like Nukem, which we already went over, <laughs> as well as uh, v- impronounceable name. Not even going to try, but their Force famous reactor. Zentrum. That one. Uh, and their famous reactor was known as the AVR reactor, uh, which ended up being probably the most like highest throughput reactor for these particles ever during its lifetime it was fed over six billion coated particles to be tested in the reactor and we'll get to why germany went through such a high throughput a little later on in any case uh the u.s and the uk actually opted for the prismatic designs that we kind of already talked about these big graphite hexagonal blocks that you could stack in kind of a modular fashion whereas germany invested in what's called pebble bed reactors. Oh, this makes sense. I and mean, you were talking about tri- so as little pebbles, right? Mm-hmm. So and pebble so bed reactors are not not nuclear reactors, but pebble uh, pebble or powder beds are used in chemical engineering all the time for all sorts of heat, heat exchange. Right, but it's not exactly what you think. It's not the, the pebbles aren't the triso particles themselves. They actually take the particles and embed them in larger particles. Oh, oh interesting. So they use the, like a... Um, cold isostatic pressing to basically create a 60 millimeter diameter spherical like large, like a tennis ball. So it's like a giant aquarium. Yeah, with all the, well, I mean, everything's fixed in place. Um, uh, yeah, and so they, there's a fuel zone right together. that's circular, and then they have an outer shell uh, just to kind of prevent these neutrons from being too close. And so what they'll end up doing is they'll dump these giant pebbles. The whole particle pebble terminology here is, is kind of confusing, especially from like a ceramic standpoint. Right. Um, but they'll put these large pebbles into the reactor, let them do their thing, and then they can also empty them and restock them. So it kind of offers this built-in recycling mechanism. Now, today, um, most people have ended up opting for, at least a lot of the Western countries have tended to opt for the prismatic designs, but China is still actively pursuing the pebble bed reactor designs just because it offers a little bit more flexibility in terms of the types of fuels you can add, right? The idea is that you could start with the uranium-based fuel, but then you could add pellets for plutonium. The kinetics and the heat transport uh, get a little bit confusing and, and different in this scenario, but that's kind of the idea. Now, initially, these particles actually just had a single carbon layer on them, and the whole function of that was just to protect the kernels from oxidation during reactor startup. Um, but many of these particles failed due to damage from fission recoils, fission gas pressures, and chemical reactions, basically the things that all these later layers were attempting to prevent. Uh, and failure where your kernel is now exposed to the rest of the reactor infrastructure yeah, is, yeah, a disaster and something that you weren't going to, not going to want to promote. Um, and so what they did notice is that you could actually retain some of the fission products within these uh, pyrocarbon layers. And that led them to kind of start to think about how can they mitigate the swelling that the kernels are doing while also maintaining the retentive properties. So that's where we start to get the first innovation of adding that porous carbon layer. The first layer. layer of gumball? Yeah, the porous carbon layer to trap gases and be compliant in the, the face of swelling, while also still having an outer layer. And that's what they would at that time call a biso, which means bi-isostructural particle. Okay, just like a core, we nowadays we call that a core shell. Like yeah. that's a much more common terminology, but it's a core shell particle. Mm-hmm. Um, from here, we start to see... Attempts at further addition of layers, the U.S. tried to go with these laminated layer approach, kind of like a composite, where by adding more and more layers, they would hope to slow crack propagation or failure uh, to subsequent layers. 
but these proved somewhat difficult to manufacture and later developments uh, such as the ability to use uh, chemical vapor deposition uh, from General Atomics and the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in the UK allowed for more isotropic coatings. Uh, and then we quickly abandoned this laminated layer approach because yeah. the coatings from the CBD were just significantly yeah. better. Makes sense. But even then, a lack of particle strength and the inability to retain any heavy fission products like cerium or strontium or cesium uh, led interest to refractory coatings for particles, and silicon carbide is the obvious choice um, just because it's the, the inability for many atoms to diffuse through it, it's high temperature performance, and it's high strength, and it's also pretty well understood as a material. It's We use it for a lot of things, right? It's an abrasive. We know how to make it with powder metallurgy because it's a tiny particle, right? We make it all the time. And thus, with the addition... Yeah, well, let's see. Yeah, and thus, with the addition of the silicon carbide, we get the trisoparticle, uh, standing similar like biso tri isostructural layer, uh, and this switch happens about in the 70s is when we start to see trisos becoming mainstream. Uh, and following that switch to the triso model, you get updates in deposition techniques and changes in the fuel composition, because virtually all of the early work in fuel particles favored a fertile thorium material and then carbide fuels. Now, when I first started in engineering i used to whenever i thought like a reactor i was like oh yeah uranium plutonium uh -huh. but they actually the alloy this right? yeah yeah rather than it just being the pure uranium or plutonium they'll actually tend to alloy it and they'll include other things like we know about a fission material but what is a fertile material and why is it thorium well just due to the lack of prevalence of fissionable uranium right i think like 0.07 yeah. percent yeah. of uranium exists naturally in the 235 isotope so it actually makes sense to include other materials called fertile materials, which they themselves aren't radioactive and won't like cause fission. But upon interacting with neutrons, they actually become fissionable. Oh, okay, gotcha. So you can include other material that you don't necessarily have to process to the same extent and still end up getting the same results. And so you're so, taking advantage of that fission process to get the what you need eventually. Yeah, that's and cool. so that's where they were using thorium because it would eventually, just through the process, become fissionable. And for the most part, these were all carbides. Uh, and the reason for that is because um, carbides can go to much higher temperatures. And so they were theoretically able to get much better results. But these were susceptible to hydrolysis reactions during fabrication, and so they would corrode or oxidize, and it was a problem. So that led to interest in oxide kernels. And these radically simplified the fabrication process because they didn't have to worry about oxidation as much. Um, they also maintained better chemical stability during the fabrication process, so they were a bit safer. Um, addition, like one of the other benefits is that a lot of the heavy metals that are produced during fission can form oxides. And so if you want to try to prevent these from attacking your silicon carbide layer, it makes sense to neutralize yeah. them in yeah, the form of an sense. oxide. Um, and this was great, but as they started to test these more and more, they noticed a few problems. As you go to higher temperatures and irradiations, the oxygen potential tends to increase quite dramatically. And because the kernels in contact with carbon, you start to form carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide gas. Yeah. So not only are you getting gases from the regular reactions, but you're going to get excess gas uh, that forms from the reaction with the... Um, As it dissociates and becomes more prone to react. Yeah, and so once they started actually using these, they noticed something that they termed the amoeba effect, or as it's better described, kernel migration. So mass transport of the carbon in the form of carbon monoxide, uh, this is driven typically by thermal gradients just in your reactor, will basically result in a displacement of the kernel, right? As carbon monoxide shifts the one side, it tends to push the, the kernel to the other. And the effect of this is that it can actually start breaking through these pyrocarbon layers and uh, escape out. Gotcha. So it can cause fracture of the particle, and then you're leaking out your fission material. So how does carbides or other materials fix this problem? Just they're less prone to react, and so you're not forming that carbon monoxide? Yeah, so... This is what the U.S. then started pursuing. So Germany largely tried to stick with the uranium oxides, and their solution to this uh, kernel migration problem ended up just being more stringent manufacturing, uh -huh. as well as just lower temperature gradients. Uh -huh. So you're not going to be able to operate your reactor as hot, or you're going to have to design it in a way that you don't have as, as strict of, um, or intensive as gradients. But the U.S. still wanted to pursue hotter reactors, more energy, and so they ended up opting for this uranium oxycarbide fuel, where you actually have an 80-20 mixture of uranium oxide and uranium carbide. And this ended up mitigating kernel migration by lowering the oxygen potential and basically kind of serving as a getter to prevent um, the formation of these gases. Now, is that at the atomic level mixing, or are these like bulk particles, like a composite mixture? This is more of a composite. 
And the advantage here was that you could have the manufacturing benefits of uranium oxide, but the higher temperature benefits of uranium carbide. Gotcha. And so theoretically, there were quite a lot of uh, benefits to this, but Germany decided to stick with uranium oxide, um, and they decided to adopt that as their standard. It's also worth noting that in the 60s and the 70s, this was still in the middle of the Cold War, and concerns about proliferation were there, but not as high. Um, and so at the time, these were all high-enriched uranium fuels. But once we got into the 80s, most of these switched to low-enriched yeah, uranium. Yeah, that changes. Uh, so this is uranium that's enriched to less than 20%. Um, additionally, the 80s kind of saw more of less uh, intensive development of the particles and more of refinements. So we switched to different methods of carbon application that prevent uh, that demonstrate better irradiation performance, uh, as well as just general optimizations. So Germany spent a lot of time and resources perfecting their manufacturing process and doing extensive safety trials of these particles. That's why they were putting through 6 billion particles through that test reactor to the point where they were able to produce some of the highest quality um, particles just out there, period. And these became the standard reference particles even for what you should be benchmarking against. The U.S., on the other hand, continued to pursue their uranium oxycarbide designs with both fizzle and fertile particles being present. Um, and they would have... They, they kept running into issues where um, particles were failing, and so they then designed the trisop particle, uh, which added just an additional pyrocarbon layer, thinking that that would help prevent it. But um, these were less satisfactory than uh, the, the Germans' uranium oxide fuel, and they still had tons of issues. Um, most of the U.S.'s triso development was halted in 1993. Is that the current state of things? No. In the early 2000s, uh, the U.S. started... Uh, revamping with the Advanced Gas Reactor Fuel Development and Qualification Program. So this was kind of in response to some of the failings in the 90s to say, okay, the Germans figured out much better manufacturing techniques. How can we look at that to make our particles safer while still using uranium oxycarbide fuels? And so just by analysis of German manufacturing techniques and collaboration, um, the whole point of this was to try to create benchmarks, standards, and qualifications for what it means to make a, a truly safe triso particle and so that started in about 2003 and by 2005 the u.s was a principal manufacturer and contained all of the requisite techniques to manufacture these at larger scale that's awesome that's way cool the other advantage is you know why the u.s stuck it out with uranium oxycarbide we talk about burn up which is the percent of your visible uranium that you actually use in reaction now, the more that you can burn up at a time means that you're basically being more efficient and with the fuel more, that you're using. More bang for your buck. Because of the limitations of uranium oxide, the Germans were only, they were pushing 14% burn up. Whereas uh, the U.S. with uranium oxycarbide fairly recently was able to get up to about 20% burn up with the uranium oxycarbide fuels. So there's, there's advantages to going this route, but a lot of our manufacturing of the coatings wasn't quite there. And that's what this initiative in the early 2000s really focused on. So I think next it's important to kind of dive into how you even make this, right? Like a sphere of uranium oxycarbide. How do you even make that? Um, so most of the time they're actually fabricated with the sol gel process, oh. in which uranium is dissolved in nitric acid. Uh, and then through the process of internal um, gelation uh, and ammonia, they basically precipitate out the metal oxide in the form of uranium oxide. Um, but this time it's UO3, not UO2, which is typically used. Um, and so you basically get a gel sphere of all these particles, and through a drying process, they then condense in a nice, controlled, perfectly spherical manner. You can dry and then sinter these. From there, they'll put these into a fluidized bed chemical vapor deposition process. So fluidized bed, basically all of these different uranium kernels are floating in air through a, a gas in the sense that they're suspended and not making contact with any sort of substrate. Um, the flowing gases are usually typically argon, uh, or hydrogen, um, depending on which coating you're doing. Uh, and by varying the concentration of the gases, they'll then flow through these and the temperatures at which they're reacting, they can kind of control the microstructure of what gets deposited on there. Okay. So for our porous low-density pyrocarbon, they basically decompose gaseous acetylene, uh, which when it deposits will form this very porous 50% um, theoretical density pyrocarbon. Um, to get that thicker, denser, they actually use a mixture of acetylene and propylene. Okay. Um, and so they will typically process these at, at certain temperatures and certain gas concentration in order to ensure that you get the isotropic structure. Um, 
And there's a difference between using high temperatures and low temperatures. Initially, they used high temperatures, but the issue is that they ended up getting a lot of irradiation cracking um, because a lot of the material was... was sintering? Yeah, yeah, too brittle. Um, or just the microstructure that formed was a little unusual or, or not not, be- not best for this situation. And so um, low temperature isotropic phases ended up being a lot better and are generally preferred and are the standard today. So this reducing atmosphere, it makes a lot of sense for how you can put down carbon. We do this still today uh, with different mixtures of you know gases that can be reduced into carbon. But how are you going to do that with silicon carbide? You can't just do that. It's not just going to like decompose out of the air. You're going to have to do a, a CVD process, right, to put the silicon carbide layers on? Yeah, absolutely. You have to find something that can hold it in a gas phase or hold silicon and, and carbon in a gas phase. So, yeah, you're not going to vaporize silicon carbide and exactly. have it then deposit. Um, so what they actually end up doing is create this organic silane, uh, specifically methyl trichlorosilane. That's your source of silicon for the silicon carbide? Yeah. And the reaction that precedes is just in the, the deposition uh, process. You go from the methyl, the methyl trichlorosilane. trichlorosilane to silicon carbide and hydrochloric acid gas. Gotcha. Um, and so ideally you want to get the HCl gas out of there, but the silicon carbide that deposits ends up being exactly what you want. Um, and there's a lot of research that's gone into what temperatures you want to process these. Essentially, your goal is to make this as dense as possible. And to, to do that, you're going to have to keep it above 1500 C. Um, because if you don't, you can actually get constituents, uh, sub-phases that form. And these can be as much as 30% of the total composition, which is not what you want. You want as fully dense as possible. Okay, so this is actually, if you haven't heard of CVD, it ends up being a really cool process, right? The ability to take gaseous forms of materials and deposit them. Like, they can make diamonds it's from this. It's a big deal, too. So many processes rely on this. And um, But what is it, like, how long does it take to make this, to go from a gas down to a solid? Well, we get a number of deposition rates. For the buffer layer, we're looking at about 15 to 25 microns per minute. Not very fast. No. Uh, and in fact, for silicon carbide, it's even slower. The Germans, to get the best possible results, recommend that you deposit at 0.18 micrometers per hour. Oh, jeez. Yeah. How thick does it got to be, though? Um, that's going to go up to about 35 microns. Oh, yeah. That's tricky. No so, wonder this took decades to figure out the processing of these things. Oh, yeah. Finding the exact right parameters and being fully optimized. So this this takes a while to do. You have to be running this pretty consistently uh, for, for a long time. Okay. So... We've talked about how consistent they've gotten with making these, but what about the failure still, right? These are supposed to be very safe, a lot safer than our current fuels, but how safe are they? Well, particle failures are typically evaluated by monitoring radioactive fission gas that are released. So these are isotopes of krypton or xenon. So by just monitoring the amount of this that escapes into our channels... You have a pretty good idea of what's happening with your fuel. Yeah. Because it it come from there. Yeah, it shouldn't come from anywhere else. And so... They actually use different indicators to indicate different types of failure. So if you have the uh, Krypton 85, it's an indicator of basically an exposed kernel. Basically, your layers have failed and the kernel is fully exposed to the rest of the reactor. Um, Release is very low in the absence of any sort of exposure. Oh, that's cool. The different products you see indicate which part of your core shell is breaking down. Yeah. So that's cool. You'll see cesium-137 or 134 uh, if you have a loss of your silicon carbide shell. Um because the pyrocarbon layer on the inside uh, doesn't protect yeah. or stop those from coming out. So you can tell specific types of failure based on um, what you're actually measuring. So this is typically what they'll do in these test reactors. They'll to look determine. for strontium, they'll look for europium, look for cesium, and based on what they find, they know what's going wrong in your, in your fuel. Mm-hmm. Too cool. Um, so they've done pretty extensive tests. They typically test at different temperatures to see when these things will fail. And they're taking these way above what they would be operating at. They're taking like 1600, 1700 C to see what is the limit of operation until these uh, particles actually start to fail. And so they'll typically try to see how long they can last. And um, nominal times for these tests are about 300 hours is what they typically try to guarantee. Um, because hopefully at that point you figured out some sort of remedial uh, method of stopping this reactor from from going off. Um, so 1600 and 1700 are fairly stable, but 1800 is really where like failure is pretty pretty imminent. But putting this in terms of like a safety regulation, at 1600 degrees Celsius, the failure fraction for uranium oxycarbide fuel is determined to be less than 6.6 times 10 to the negative fifth, Ooh. which is a factor that's 10 times lower than the design specifications for allowable particle failures during accidents in U.S. designed. So, like, current regulations, they are 10 times, le- a factor of 10 times less. 
Yeah, so this like sort of fail. This whole episode just really has me thinking how frustrating it is to be a material science engineer who cares about energy. Like I, so much of my research is energy because you hear people frantically trying to find the the solution. There's some solution out there to our energy crisis, and I'm looking around being like. Guys, it's nuclear. It's nuclear. We, we've already, it's so hard that everyone thinks that there's some technological thing that we have to unlock and it's already there. It's a, it's largely a regulatory challenge. Not that there's not continued technological challenges in nuclear, but safe nuclear is already possible. So it's so frustrating to see it being so uh, downplayed as a, as a viable resource to, for large scale energy reliance. Yeah. It's one of the strangest industries um, that I've ever had to research because unlike other things, it's not really that economics is driving it or um, the just ab- ability to make certain materials. It really comes down to politics and regulation. Whether or not your nuclear company succeeds or fails is really just a based on the general sentiment in politics yeah. of whether or not nuclear should be pursued or not, um, which makes it kind of tricky and it makes it frustrating because you could have really great reactor design. You could have really great uh, fuel materials. And if it's not popular or there's, you know, some sort of uh, pushback again from other yeah, industries. Yep. It's not happening. It's tough. When about ten years ago, when I was I was a postdoc becoming a new professor, there was a book written by Michael Nordhaus or Ted Nordhaus and Michael Schellenberger called Breakthrough, and it is arguing that like renewables are the future. That was the whole premise of the book. Like we're we're screwed, but for renewables, and that they're going to solve our problems. And it's been so interesting now, almost ten years later, to see Michael Schellenberger, one of the co-authors. He's now. To come full circle on it. And he's like, I wrote that book, but here's all the problems with renewables. They are not energy dense. They are intermittent. They are expensive. They have their own safety issues. And he's come full circle to be the biggest advocate for nuclear that you've ever met. And so he's got a recent book, Apocalypse Never, which I encourage people to check out. In my, It's been influential in my own life. And it's been fun to see that honest scientist who isn't just like committed to what they've always done, but is open to seeing possible changes for something better. Anyways, I'm a big fan of nuclear because of those arguments put forward by it. And it's exciting that it's also an area that's fertile for materials research because this is an area where we need material scientists to help solve continuing problems as we move from existing reactors to these Gen 4 ones. Yeah, and most of these materials, right, we talked about nuclear cross-section. It means structure doesn't really doesn't really matter, right? Like you can create a great material with a great structure, but if it captures neutrons, it's not going to be used. And unfortunately... All the materials that can be used are some of the hardest uh, and most exotic materials out there. So there's tons of work that needs to be done and tons of opportunities for material scientists to get involved. Uh, We had a lot of fun researching this episode. I think we learned a lot and are happy to share it with you. All of the information that we discussed today came from publicly available literature. Uh, We'll post all of those links uh, where you can read and dive even more. Like we can only scratch the surface on this episode, Uh, but you can dive in and read even more about them. Um, via those. So definitely check the description if you're interested. There will be links to all of those. Okay. Huge thanks to the people that make this show possible. Thanks. You know, I don't shout out enough to Jared, all the work he does to edit these. Thanks, Jared, for doing that. Thanks for the people that gave us music. We have fun music in the show because of folks like Alphabot and Colbyte. So thanks for supporting them. If you check them out, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Um, big thanks to you guys as listeners. Big thanks to the people that leave us reviews, except for the people who say that Jared's doing a great job. You know that's giving him a big head. He's got a big head as it is. And then you're telling him he's doing a great job. Keep you, it up. You don't realize what I have to deal with over here. No, yeah, I, I'm the diva now here. <laughs> but for real, thank you for supporting this show. Keep sending suggestions for episodes. Help share this with folks you think might like it. Yeah, and if you have 30 seconds, just go to materialismpodcast.com and check out our nice graphics, try the search function that actually works. It's really great. And if you're a listener to the podcast, head over and subscribe to Sparks on YouTube because that's where we post them. And also, the more people who subscribe, it's going to get us to more people, so more people start listening to us. Got to get those algorithms working in our favor. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one, guys. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.